Hey, I am so thankful to be back with you. Uh, if you're visiting today, my name is Johnny Artavanis, and uh, I love the Masters University, one of my favorite places on planet Earth, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity to open up God's Word with you this morning. How was the Monty's last night? I was bummed to miss it. I was going to try to come. Emma and Bree, where, did Bree sing? I've been trying to get Bree to sing forever. Um, amazing. Well, I'm so glad that you guys had a good time. What I want you to do is I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 1. I've been preaching through the Gospel of John at our church, which is in Franklin, Tennessee. And uh, we've loved kind of getting settled in the area. My wife Katie and our two little baby girls, and it's a joy. But John chapter 1, and to give you kind of a, the theme of John's Gospel... He provides for us a purpose statement in John chapter 20, verse 31. He says, These things I have written to you so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, and in believing you may have life in his name. John is going to put together a convincing argument. And you need to understand this argument, Master's University student, that Jesus is in fact the long-awaited and anticipated Messiah. And so when we know the thesis statement, it helps us to understand everything else that is included along the way. In the opening section of John's gospel, he details for us that Jesus is the creator of the world, that he is the word made flesh, that he is the same God who said, let there be light. Before John ever introduces Jesus as savior, he wants you to know first and fundamentally that Jesus Christ is the creator of the world. Jesus Christ made you. In order for you to behold who he is as Savior, you need to understand that he is the one who knit you together in your mother's womb. And the same God who said, let there be light at the dawn of creation is the only God that can say, let there be light into the darkness of a human soul. Now, after laying out these key features in the prologue, the first and foremost, really, uh, validating witness to the person of Jesus Christ is the man introduced in John chapter 1, verse 6. His name is John the Baptist. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness, verse 7, to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. You're going to see that key word, testify, over and over again throughout John's gospel. Look with me at verse 15 of chapter 1. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. In verse 19 of chapter 1, turn there, we enter the narrative. There's this really introduction in the first 18 verses, and then the story begins in verse 19. And again, it continues with the testimony of John the Baptist. Verse 19, this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now remember, John, the gospel writer, is making an argument. He wants you to know with absolute certainty that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. And in order to do that, he provides, well, just think with me. In the court of law, one of the things that you need is corroborating testimony. You need a witness. And John serves as that witness in John's gospel. Why? Why John the Baptist? Well, can I just put it to you this way? John the Baptist is the most powerful preacher the world has seen in 400 years. In the last book of the Old Testament, in the last chapter of the Old Testament, in the last paragraph of that last chapter of the last book in the Old Testament, there is the prophesied Elijah who is going to come, and he's going to make way for the Messiah. And John the Baptist shows up on the scene, and he is preaching in a way that no one has ever heard. He's saying, the axe is laid at the root of the tree, bear fruit, or you'll be cut down and thrown, to, thrown into the fire. And he's baptizing people. And what's interesting about that? Because at this time, the only people that were baptized were Gentiles who were trying to be converted into Judaism. And yet John is baptizing Jew and Gentile alike. Why? Because he is trying to raise up every valley, push down every mountain, level out the playing field. Because the Jews respond and say, we have Abraham as our father. And John responds and says, listen, you could have Abraham, Moses, and Elijah as your father. You could be a pastor's kid. You could be an elder's kid. You could be a missionary's kid. It does not matter because what you're going to need in order to be made right with this God 
is you're going to need to have him totally do a work in your life. You're going to have to repent. There is more written by secular first century historians on John the Baptist than there is on Jesus Christ. In Josephus' writing, he is the central figure. And people are convicted. They're confessing their sin. They're being baptized in the Jordan. They're flocking to hear him preach. And so they ask him, are you the Messiah? He says, no. Then they ask him, are you Elijah? He says, no. Then they ask him, are you the prophet? To which he responds, no. In verse 22, they say, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? We find out that John the Baptist was there and these men come to him and they're questioning him, saying, who are you? We've been sent by the Pharisees. If you're not the Messiah, if you're not, Elijah, if you're not the prophet, what gives you the audacity and authority to baptize people in the way that you are doing? Who are you? Verse 23, he gives an answer. And he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. No self-promotion, just self-deflection. He's a pothole filler, making way for the king. Jesus will later on say in Matthew 11 that up to that point in human history, John the Baptist is the greatest man who was ever born. But John has a smaller estimation of his life and ministry than Jesus Christ does. It's always good that way, right? I like what Leon Morris says. He says, no man is what he is in his own eyes. He really is only as he is known to God. John says in verse 27, I'm just trying to summarize this first chapter for you until we get to where we're going to land. John says in verse 27, I'm not only willing to be his servant, I'm not, I'm willing to be a slave, but I'm just not worthy. He says, it is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. There is a, a main differentiation between a disciple and a slave. A disciple of the rabbi would take care of all their needs He would go and set up things for them, just like the disciples did with Jesus in the Passover. He would set up meetings. He would get them food. But there was one thing that distinguished a disciple from a slave, and that is that a disciple was never required to wash or untie the sandals of their rabbi. That would be demeaning. That would be humiliating. And John the Baptist says, you you need to understand something. It's not that I am unwilling to, to untie his sandals. I am unworthy to untie his sandals. Okay. Our text for today. And we're going to take the scenic route and then come back to this. Verse 29. The next day he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want to frame our time today by looking at four words that you need to understand. I do get the reality that you are at the Master's University and you study theology and you've done Old Testament survey and New Testament survey. But my goal, if it's just, if I can just give it to you real plainly, is for you to have a magnified understanding in 36 minutes and five seconds of what John the Baptist means when he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I want to do that by looking at four words. And I want to look at these four words in two pairings. Two pairings with two words each. The first set of words I want you to understand are provision and substitution. Provision and substitution. I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn with me to Genesis 22. Keep your finger there and John chapter 1. We're going to look at some familiar accounts. Now, Abraham lived some 2,000 years before Jesus Christ. It says in Matthew's genealogy that there are 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the Babylonian exile, and then 14 generations from the exile to Jesus Christ. Therefore, there are 42 generations from Abraham to the arrival of Jesus Christ. And I say that only to mention to you that when you look at the Scripture, you're not only looking at the most accurate source of theology, but the most accurate source of history in the world. 
Now, in the garden, God had told Adam and Eve that when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they shall surely, what? Talk to me. Die. Now, after they ate the fruit, it says that their eyes were opened, they understood their nakedness, and they hid from God. But can I ask you to just notice something interesting? Why are Adam and Eve alive in Genesis chapter 4? When they sin in chapter 3, and in chapter 2, verse 17, God had told them that in the day they sin, they shall surely, talk to me again, die. Chapter 4 doesn't begin with a funeral service, but with the birth of babies. It says in 4, 1 and 2, now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to it his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So not only are, there, are they alive, they're having children. So what happened? Well, it's in Genesis 3.21, you know. It says, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Here in the garden, a fundamental theme emerges and that is substitution. The only way a sinner can live is if something innocent dies in their place. Where did these garments of skin come from? Well, God performed the first animal sacrifice. Okay, Genesis 22, you know the story. Read with me in verses 1 and 2. It says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Three times in this chapter, we will read of God's command for Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son. Look with me again at verse 2. It says in 2, take now your son, your only son. Now look with me at verse 12. It says in 12b, I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Look now at verse 16. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son. So back to 22 verse 2, God tells Abraham to go up to a land of Moriah. In verse 5, it says, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. So the servants and the donkeys are left behind, and they go on foot to the altar of sacrifice. In verse 6, it says, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And then in verse 7, a question is asked. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham responds, God will, what? Provide. Substitution, and here's the second word, provision. What exactly is God going to provide? Abraham isn't necessarily sure. He's going to provide something. In Hebrews 11, we read that Abraham was so confident in the plan and purposes of God that even if he killed Isaac, he believed with all of his heart that God was going to raise Isaac back from the dead. But now, with tears in his eyes and the keen edge of a blade raised, we read in verses 9 and 10, Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now what happens? You know, maybe, if you've grown up in the church, the angel of the Lord cries out, Stop the knife! Don't do it, Abraham! Don't do it! Don't slay your one and only son. God will provide 
a substitute. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering. Watch this. In the place of his son, that substitution, Abraham, verse 14, called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. What exactly does God provide? God provides a substitute. Isaac would have had a fundamental motto the rest of his life since the time when he was a teenager until the moment he died. The only reason I am alive is because a lamb died in my place. The only reason I am alive is because a lamb died in my place. The next birthday, the same reiteration of that life slogan, provision and substitution. Turn over with me now to Exodus chapter 12. Now, the people of God are in Egypt in Exodus chapter 12. There are 10 plagues in which God showcases his power not only over Pharaoh, but over the Egyptian gods, or we would say even demons. The tenth and final plague is the death of the firstborn. And there is only one way to protect your firstborn. Do you know what it is? The blood of a lamb, a substitute. It says in 12.2, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. So God is telling the Hebrew people that the Passover month is going to be the first month of the year for them. They're not operating off of the lunar calendar. This year, the Passover will take place the last week of April for the Jewish people. In verse 5 of chapter 12, God is giving Moses these instructions. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So there's an option there. Verse 6, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. When is twilight? Twilight is between the two evenings. It would have been 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, it would begin this commencement. Moses is about to give these instructions to two plus million people. And he's just going to say, everyone set your alarms. Because at three o'clock in the afternoon, you're all going to slaughter a lamb. Verse seven. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. Go to verse 12 for me. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Sometimes it's easy to miss the forest for the trees. Why do the Jews call this celebration the Passover? because the angel of death passed over the houses that were covered in the blood of the lamb. The destroyer is coming. It celebrates this celebration and commemorates the night the angel of death spared them and passed over the houses covered in the blood of the lamb. Look with me now at verse 22. What are they gonna do with this blood? Verse 22, you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. Why? Moses is saying, end of verse 22. Listen here, boys and girls, men and women, anybody here, do not go outside until morning. Do not go outside. It's not safe out there. The only way for you to be safe is inside, covered by the blood of the lamb. And if you were to venture out, you will be destroyed. Why, Moses? Verse 23, for Yahweh will pass through to smite the Egyptians 
And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow, watch this, the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give to you, as he promised, you shall observe this rite. And when your children say to you, what does this rite mean to you? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel and Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. What's the response? And the people bowed low and worshiped. For the next 1,400 years, the Jews had a celebration every year. And they were remembering that the only way that they were saved from death is because God provides a substitute to die in their place. Okay, the second pairing of two words. The first that we just looked at is provision and substitution. Now I want to look with you at two bigger words, propitiation and expiation. Big words, but you memorize your fantasy quarterback's football stats, and I think you can get this. I want you to take your Bibles and turn over one book to Leviticus 16. This may be where you get lost in your Bible reading plan, but you need to understand this. Because the various words that describe the sacrificial system are essential to understand so that you can really fathom the paradigm shift in the gospel. Propitiation and expiation, and we're going to look at Leviticus 16 for a moment. The most important sacrifice took place on the Day of Atonement. Now, for you to understand your Bible, you need to understand that Leviticus is the answer to the tension that is there at the end of Exodus. Because the majority of the book of Exodus is not on the plagues. The majority of the book of Exodus is on the tabernacle. God did not deliver his people to ditch them. He delivered them so that they might dwell with him. And he wants to establish a tabernacle amongst them. And once it's finished, it says in Exodus chapter 40, Moses and Aaron could not enter the tabernacle. This is a crisis moment. And you need to understand, even when you're looking at your Old Testament, from Exodus 19, when they arrive at, Sin at Sinai, to Numbers chapter 10, so the second half of Exodus, all of Leviticus, and the first 10 chapters of Numbers all takes place in a matter of a couple months at the foot of Mount Sinai. And Leviticus is a series of sermons that answers the question, who can approach a holy God? And after the, the debacle in Leviticus 10, there is implemented a, a system called the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. Leviticus 16 really functions as the apex of the Pentateuch. It is the literary fulcrum upon which the law rests. Now look with me at 16.2. And just pause for a second. W what am I doing? Why all the background? You can be at the master's university and not understand the glory of God as revealed in his word. You need to understand the great story that's happening here because the word of God is worthy to be understood. And the deeper you go, the higher and more elevated is your worship. 16.2, the Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will, what? Die, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat seat. What's he going to do? 16.7. Aaron's going to take, it says, he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one, lo one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So here's, here's the scene, the drama that's happening. Every single person is gathered there on the day of atonement. No one's like, hey, let me know what happens. I'll be at my kid's game. No, everybody's there. Two million people. Aaron comes out He's got two goats making noises. No one's talking. Everyone is watching the drama. Has a couple die or so in his hand. He rolls them and he's casting lots. One of these goats is going to be slaughtered and it's going to be an absolute bloodbath. And the other goat is going to have the sins of the people confessed on that goat 
And then he is going to be driven out into the wilderness to experience total abandonment, total dereliction, total exile from the presence and glory of God. One is going to be representing propitiation, the other expiation. So they cast lots. In 16.9, it says, Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. This is propitiation. I'll explain what this means in greater detail in a moment. 16.10 says, But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. So Aaron is going to do this elaborate system. It's a drama playing out before the eyes of God's people for 1,400 years before Jesus comes. But before Aaron does any of this, what does he first have to do? Well, he has to make sacrifices for his own family and for himself. Why? Because he's a sinner. Verse 11, Then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself, for himself, for himself, and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. Do you think the Bible's trying to hammer anything home? This... Moses and Aaron are the godliest guys on planet earth for himself, for himself, for himself. You better diminish who you think Aaron and Moses are because they cannot even approach God, God is saying to the people, unless they are covered in the blood of an innocent substitute. And then what else is he gonna do? Verse 12, he shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar before the Lord and take two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil. He shall put incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is in the ark of the testimony. Pause there. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to start a little fire. He's going to take two handfuls of incense. He's going to walk in like this with a fire pan of incense creating this cloud of smoke before he goes into the Holy of Holies because there's only one guy one day a year that can go into the Holy of Holies and that's the high priest. But before he even goes into the Holy of Holies, he first has to do what? He has to offer a sacrifice for himself, then for his entire family. Then he's got to create this little fire system, make a cloud, go in like this. Why? Because he cannot behold the glory of God and live. So he has to create this fog. Because in 13b it says, otherwise he will die. 14, moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. You just need to understand there is blood everywhere. Everywhere. Sometimes, you know, people, I'm not, I'm not a blood person. <laughs> Every single person in Israel understood that the only way to cleanse the defilement of human sin is blood. And it wasn't just like Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, mm, let's write our names. No, he's taking slaughtered animals. He's dipping his fingers, sloshing and, and tossing and spreading and manipulating that blood everywhere. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no, what? Forgiveness of sins. Verses 15 through 18. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Watch this four times in the next three verses. You're going to read an important word. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus... He shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all of the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar on all sides." Atonement, atonement, atonement. A failure to understand this doctrine is a failure to understand the gospel. Atonement means that the estranged sinner, this is what you need. The estranged sinner can be reconciled to God, have right relations with him restored, 
but a price has to be paid. And this atonement is based on a substitute that takes your punishment and therefore satisfies the wrath of God in your place. I worked here for a number of years, and I never heard anybody talk about Leviticus, you know, in chapel. And um, maybe, you're, maybe you're going, to, I, man, this is a lot. Quiet. I was joking. Now. <laughs> the most important question anyone can ever ask is how can God be just and not punish a guilty sinner? This is the apex of theological thought. How can God forgive you and be holy? If God just said to you in your sin, hey, no worries, bro, I got you. What does that tell you about God? What does it call into question? It calls into question the very holiness, justice, and integrity of God. And so Yom Kippur is here in Leviticus 16, but do you know what that literally means? It means a covering. It wasn't final. These sacrifices just pointed towards the one that would be. It says in Hebrews 10, 4, the blood of goats and rams can never take away sin. Okay, look with me at verse 19. With his finger, he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it seven times and cleanse it from the impurities of the sons of Israel consecrated. I was preaching on the sacrificial system and a kid came up that was listening to my sermon at my church and he drew me a picture and he got the point. What color was it? Blood red. Blood red. The only way you can be forgiven, even the holiest of men, is through blood. No, no sin is left unpunished. And watch this and we'll be done in our Leviticus study. Verse 20, when he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then he shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all of the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all of their transgressions in regards to all of their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of the man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. Okay, so we can go back to our two words now. Propitiation and expiation are intertwined, and they both serve and constitute as an act of placation by which the wrath and anger of God towards sin are satisfied and the necessary separation from God and the sinner are realized. You need to understand, even sometimes, I told you before that when I worked in camping ministry, sometimes people would say, we don't want you to say hell, Johnny. We would much prefer if you said separation from God. But you need to understand that there are two sides of the punishment that you deserve. You deserve to have God's wrath poured out on your sin, but not just his wrath poured out. He needs to be distanced from your sin. And so one of these goats would absorb the wrath of God, and the other goat was going to absorb the necessary abandonment by God that the sinner deserved. Propitiation involves the first slaughtered goat. Satisfying God's wrath. Do you know where we see this idea first? Well, we see it in the garden, but we also see it after the flood in Genesis 8. We're redoing our children's area at our church right now, and I said, hey, make it cute for the kids, you know. Um, so they, well, we can do Noah's Ark. The giraffes and the elephants, and one of the realities that I asked them, and I'm just joking, I said, where are all the people drowning? <laughs> no one would do that, right? But the, the crisis of the flood story is the offended and aggravated heart of God. Even after the waters of divine judgment had abated, the situation was not changed. God is not appeased. His wrath towards sin is not pacified. So at the dawn of a new creation, you know what happens? Noah builds an altar, offers up a burnt offering to the Lord, and do you know how it describes that aroma? It says that the sacrifice Noah offered was pleasing or soothing to the Lord. It was like a fragrant incense to God. Now, expiation, I told you, involves the second goat. The second goat restored the disposition of God towards the sinner. The second goat was literally 
and symbolically cursed. The priest would lay his hands on the goat, confess all of the sins of all of the people, and then drive that goat into total dereliction. And the transfer of guilt over to the animal continued this eastward trajectory, away from God, away from God. When the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, he's going west, and it's symbolizing this reversal of the Edenic exile. But now this goat is being driven east and east and east, away from God, away from God. Why the directions, Johnny? Because in Psalm 103, verse 12, it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed your transgressions from you. That's not just metaphorical, it's literal. Because two cherubim are stationed on the east side of Eden. Get away from here now, and you cannot come. That's why even among secular authors, John Steinbeck wrote a book called East of Eden, because you and I now live in a world that is cursed, east of Eden. And we deserve only further separation from God. And so God is sending these goats away, away, away. This is necessary for atonement. God's wrath had to be poured out. And man's guilt had to be removed so that they would not be exiled. Can I just draw your attention to something? You've likely heard a Christian share their testimony and say, I was saved at such and such a time and at such and such a place. But what are you saved from? What are you saved from? One of the saddest things is that you can grow up in the church your entire life and not understand that answer. And not know the answer to the most basic question in the Bible. What are you saved from? If you miss this, you miss everything. To be saved is to be rescued from the wrath and alienation of God. Anytime someone tries to deny this, watch out because the gospel is at stake. Hebrews 10 and 31 says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So what we need is a lamb. We need a substitute to appease the wrath of God towards sin. Some people may, might say to you, I, I don't want to believe in a God of wrath. It doesn't matter what we want to believe. It matters how God reveals himself in his word. In our sin, we deserve judgment. Therefore, we need a savior. We need a sacrifice. We need a final, perfect, spotless, blameless lamb. Okay, back to John 1. Can I put some pieces together? 2,000 years after God told Abraham to take his son, his one and only son, up the mountain. 2,000 years after his son would carry the wood of the sacrifice up the mountain. 2,000 years after God told Abraham, stop the knife. Another one and only son would march up that same exact mountain. Mount Moriah is Golgotha. It's the same place. And this time, a one and only son was loaded up with wood, not logs for a burnt offering, but a wooden cross. There this son was bound to the altar of sacrifice, not with ropes, but with nails. And unlike the first time, God would not stop the knife. He is going to bring the knife down and crush his son. Isaac asked the question in Genesis 22. I see this. I see the wood. I see the altar. And then he asks, behold, where is the lamb? And 2,000 years later, John says in John 1, 29, behold, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world for thousands of years. Where is the Lamb? Where is the Lamb? Where is the final, perfect, blameless, substitutionary Lamb that God provides that satisfies His wrath and removes human guilt, the crushing guilt? And with a pointed finger, John the Baptist says, there He is. There's the Lamb. I remember singing the song Growing up in the 90s, a great decade. Your only son, 
No sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. And then the chorus is, O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in his precious blood. My Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. 1,500 years after Moses... Another lamb would be slaughtered at three o'clock in the afternoon. At the exact same time, all of the other Passover lambs were being slaughtered. And his blood ran red, not down a wooden mantle, but down a wooden cross. And if you're a young boy, you would have asked your dad, Dad, how many more years do we have to do this Passover celebration? When is this going to be finished? When is this going to be done? When is the final Passover lamb coming? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. At the day of atonement, there were two goats, one that was led to the slaughter and another that would serve as the symbol of abandonment and exile, of being forsaken. And the final lamb was prophesied in Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus Christ. It says, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and the chastisement for our peace fell upon him. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. It's a great definition of sin, right? All of us like sheep have gone astray. Every single person in here, including you and you and you, have turned to their own way. But what happened? But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and a sheep before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Do you remember how the burnt offering was pleasing to the Lord in Genesis 8 after the flood? It says in Isaiah 53, 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. Who's him? His one and only son, to render him as a guilt offering. 1 Peter 1, 18 says, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. Did you know that? You're not bought with silver or gold. What purchased you? You were a slave to sin. What purchased you? What was the currency involved? First Peter 1 Peter 1.19, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. 1 John 2.2 2 says, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. What's propitiation mean? It means... It's the wrath of God. It's the full satisfaction of the wrath of God. The goat of expiation was driven off to experience alienation in the wilderness because God not only has to punish sin, he has to abandon the sinner, to forsake the sinner. And the final lamb will cry out in Matthew 27, 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you understand that the pain of the cross is not just the nails and the whips and the beatings and the scourgings and the thorns and the spear in his side? The pain of the cross for Jesus Christ was that on the cross, he endured the wilderness. Jesus says, God, my Father, please let this cup pass from me. What cup? The, cu- the cup of divine judgment and total separation. And on the cross, Jesus drank that cup to the dregs every last drop. That same goat that was driven into the wilderness was cursed because all of the guilt of the people was placed on the goat and driven away. Maybe you know the gospel. Maybe you understand that God has forgiven you of your sin, but can I just ask you this? Do you still feel guilty about the sin that you believe that God has forgiven you of? It's because you need God to both forgive you and you need God to remove your guilt and your shame. And on the cross, Jesus didn't just die for your sin. He died for your shame. That goat was cursed. And in Galatians 3, it says, Jesus Christ has become a curse for us. The sacrificial system was never finished. But when the final lamb was led to the slaughter at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out, it was finished. And John says, behold... And 129, this is the lamb. I don't even know if John knows what he's talking about right now. Because in Matthew, he's going to say, I thought you were 
coming to be a political, economic, and military hero. But then he'll say again in verse 35 of chapter 1, Again, the next day John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. What do we do with the Lamb of God? What's the application here? What's the take home? Well, I think it's in the text. John says, Behold. Behold, in verse 36. Behold, in verse 29. That means to look to Jesus. You know, that was a religious setting in which John made that exhortation. But I wonder how many people were there that day that never looked at the Lamb never set their gaze and never set their hope upon God himself. Potentially, they didn't think they needed a lamb. Jesus says in John 6, 40, whoever looks to the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. To look is to behold, and to behold is to believe, and to believe in verse 37, it says the two disciples heard him speak and they followed him. Can I ask you, student, have you ever followed Jesus Christ because you understand who he is as the Lamb of God that dies in your place? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? What happens to those who look to Jesus? Well, again, the answer is in the text. It says, behold the Lamb of God who, what? Isn't this enough to just want you to sing? Who takes away the sin of the world. This is your greatest need in life. This is my greatest need in life. You need your sins taken away. And there he is. The only one that can take away your sin. Your crushing guilt. Maybe you even feel that guilt right now. You can be here and not know the Lord. You can feel it. You can know it. What do I do with my sin? Behold the Lamb of God. He'll take it away. Are you holding on to your sin? Do you feel the weight of guilt? Do you do, just sense God's judgment on your life? And the scripture beckons you to come and bathe in the blood of the lamb. I was listening to the hymn a couple weeks ago. Can I read it for you? Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. Would you be whiter? Yes, brighter than snow. There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There's no sin so great that the powerful blood of the Lamb cannot totally clean. Do you want to be whiter and brighter than snow? Come and bathe, come and bathe in the power of the blood. One final verse and then I'll pray. Because I want you to know that this is one of the most amazing themes in scripture. Can I show you heaven's song in Revelation 5? Revelation 5 says, starting in verse 8, when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands upon thousands, and they are not singing softly. They are thundering, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb... 
be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped the lamb. Do you know the lamb? Can you say in your heart, I've beheld the lamb of God. And in response to that, you saw it here. I bow down. I'll bow down and worship the Lamb of God for through his blood he has purchased for God a people of every tribe, tongue, nation. What a wonderful reality. Can I pray for us? God, we love you. Lord, we're thankful for the truth of Scripture, Lord, that there is one story that you are writing, 66 books, 40 authors, three languages, three continents, one story. John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lord, and I can't help think that even at a university like this, there are still people that think that they can do away with their own sin and guilt and shame by working their way towards you. Lord, I pray that they would come and bathe in the cleansing blood, the crimson tide, and that they would in their heart behold the Lamb. We pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen.